Hello everyone, welcome to the Generation Y Conservative Show. I'm your host, Chris Ford. Today we'll be speaking with a Pennsylvania organization that combats human sex trafficking and ways that you can get involved to help. I will also address the current climate between Black Lives Matter movement and police officers. Then we'll stop by and interview a local gun shop owner to find out how politics and recent events affect and drive gun sales at his store. We'll end the show with my conservative reflection, a breakup letter that you won't want to miss. But first, let's talk about recent political hot topics. Within the last two weeks, we have seen the assassination of eight police officers. On July 7th, Micah Xavier Johnson opened fire on police officers in Dallas, Texas, killing five and wounding nine. On July 17th, Gavin Eugene Long opened fire in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, killing another three police officers. I will be addressing this violence later in the show, but for now I will say this. Our country has some deep issues we're dealing with right now, but whether your skin is black or your uniform is blue, we need to recognize that violence on either side is not the answer and only instigates further violence and anger, not a conversation to move forward together. The Republican National Convention had a dramatic start on Monday as anti-Trump forces attempted to derail the nomination process with shouts and angry chants. Outside the convention was even more of a circus, with some Trump supporters open carrying firearms and opposing protesters that included nude women protesting Trump's apparent anti-woman agenda. I'm beginning to wonder if those same women will show up in Philadelphia for the Democratic National Convention to protest with the women that claim Bill Clinton raped them, or if Code Pink, who protested on Monday that Trump is bought and paid for, will show up to chant and protest against Hillary Clinton, who happens to be a huge recipient of Wall Street donations. In Pennsylvania political news, Pat Toomey, who is running against Democrat Katie McGinty, has come out in support of Trump's choice for vice president, saying that Mike Pence is a thoughtful, sensible conservative. Toomey has voiced his concern over Trump's candidacy and will be skipping the Republican National Convention, instead opting to stay here in Pennsylvania to continue campaigning for the Senate against McGinty. Toomey is certainly not the only prominent Republican to skip the convention, which many believe has more to do with Trump as the party's candidate. When we come back, I address the current Black Lives Matter and police officer environment and how we can start coming together as a nation to overcome some of these problems. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Generation Y Conservative Show. A couple weeks ago, I had lined up an interview with a local police officer who is also a firearms instructor for the department. He had agreed to do an interview with me because he felt, as I do, that this country needs to put the work in to build a bridge between the police presence and the communities that they serve in. In light of recent events over the last two weeks, the interview was unfortunately canceled. The officer informed me that while he completely agrees that now is the time to have this conversation, he isn't willing to risk his job, security, and potentially the safety of him and his family. I completely understand and respect his decision, but I feel this is a conversation that needs to be had and is often biased one way or the other. In a recent working paper study, Roland G. Fryer Jr., professor of economics at Harvard, studied more than 1,000 shootings in 10 major police departments across the country. He found that in fatal police shootings, race was not a factor. However, it should be noted that non-lethal police confrontations like touching, pushing, shoving, pepper spray, and handcuffing are more aggressive for black men and women. When I spoke with the officer I was going to interview, we covered a range of issues and solutions. He acknowledged that while it is scary that police officers are being executed, he also understands the frustration. In his mind, the police force is undertrained because of a lack of funding. He feels that the current training is lacking and men and women enter the field without being fully prepared to pull or not pull the trigger during a critical situation. Over the last two weeks, I have seen my social media feeds flooded with people taking sides. People are frustrated with the targeting by police officers, incarceration rates and poverty among black men and women, while the other side is frustrated with what appears to be a broad anti-police mentality that is calling for militant actions. What do these two views have in common? I believe that we have elected officials, media personalities, and community leaders using labels to further concrete the notion that we are in fact different. And if different, 
that we must be on opposing sides. The message I have heard from the black community is that they have been singled out for too long based on broad sweeping stereotypes that discriminate their actions before they even act. That making a generalization of a whole group of people based on the pigmentation of the, their skin is not only unfair but sometimes deadly. The police officers that are truly guilty of racial discrimination in the field and proven guilty are not the police officers that are being attacked in our streets. And so officers who are innocent of such discrimination fall victim to the same broad sweeping generalizations of a whole group of people based solely on the uniform that they wear. What both sides are trying to shout through the fog of media hyped protests and calls for violence is we are human too. Forget the labels based on the color of your skin or the uniform that you wear over it. Beneath it all is someone just as scared of the violence aimed at them. So how do we start a healing process? One idea that was floated in our simple conversation was that of a panel, be it local, city, county, or state, composed of retired police officers, minority community leaders, faith leaders, and possibly others. The objective of this panel is to review cases in their locale of alleged neglect to investigate the intent and circumstances surrounding alleged discrimination. This panel would then work with local officials and media to present the clearest facts surrounding the case to clear the air of any wild accusations on either side. Make no mistake about it, we are purposely being divided as a nation along the lines of race, sex, gender, faith, and social class to take our eyes off of a bigger issue that affects us all and instead putting us into different groups that encourage us to hate each other instead of love one another to work and get things done. To overcome massive economic and social issues we are dealing with here in America. Let's get back to Lady Justice being blindfolded and presume innocence until proven guilty. Not every black man or woman is a criminal. Let's treat everyone with the same respect. But at the same time, let's also not forget that the last thing 99.9% .9 of police officers want to do is pull that gun from its holster and pull the trigger. They don't want to do it. We are supposed to treat officers with respect, no matter who we are. But I am not blind to realizing that with that respect comes the fair treatment in return. That's where we are. We have to work together to bridge this national divide. It's not just a one-sided problem. It's going to take respect, love, and a little faith for us to move forward. Coming up next, we have a local organization here to speak with us about human sex trafficking. Is it happening here? And how can we recognize it? We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Christy Dominguez of the organization VAST, or Valley Against Sex Trafficking. Christy has her bachelor's in social work and communication studies from Kutztown University as well as a Master's of Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania. Christy was recently appointed Executive Director of VAST. Christy, welcome. Thank you very much for coming Thanks in. Thanks for having us. So Christy, tell me a little bit about VAST and how you guys came together and a brief background of the leaders within your organization. So five years ago, I was not around in the Lehigh Valley, but five years ago, two clinical social workers, um, our organization co-founders, they started seeing this as a possible issue in the Lehigh Valley through their practice and through some of their research. So they, they became students of what is trafficking, and they realized that it was happening here in the Lehigh Valley, right under their noses. And so they got together a community meeting and a group of people and really just had this very grassroots beginning that we're still trying to preserve today and just they began raising awareness within their own community and then after that they realized that they needed to do something and so it moved into taking action and calling calling uh, different key people in the community who could put together a response team to identify victims and to to start m prosecuting cases right. um, and that also then led to them to, to providing aftercare for some of our victims because there was just there was not the same awareness that there is today, there was not five years ago, and so no one knew where, knew where to go with the victims. So we have this awareness, action, and aftercare theme that began five years ago, and we've carried that strategy on until this very moment, and we're celebrating our fifth year anniversary this year. Great, okay. So let people know what constitutes sex trafficking, mm -hmm. and how prevalent is that here in the United States? Yeah. 
So, well, trafficking in general, so the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, TVPA for short, it, it constitutes any type of trafficking as force, fraud, and coercion. So if any of those three elements are taking place, whether it's domestically, whether it's trade for sex, um, or, or if it's labor services, that's trafficking. Mm. Uh, the reason, vast, we acknowledge that that trafficking happens everywhere. Uh, all, all forms of trafficking happen in the Lehigh Valley. Um, I would say that what we see predominantly happening in the Lehigh Valley and what we've been able to find with our FBI uh, partner and law enforcement partners is sex trafficking. And so, so the reason that this is more prevalent and that we're seeing it is because off, very often in history, prostitution has just been prostitution. And now with the awareness of sex trafficking, we're understanding that most prostitution I've seen, I've seen data from 85 to 95% of prostitution is pimp controlled. Oh. So if a pimp is using force, fraud, or coercion to have a woman that he manages sell sex, that is trafficking. Okay. So you, again, you go back to that force, fraud, and coercion, and you think about where is prostitution happening in the United States? Well, sex trafficking is definitely happening there too. Okay. Uh, you know, when I think of sex crimes like this, I think of the majority of the victims being female, mm -hmm. but that's certainly not the case. I mean, we're looking at young teenage boys and even, you know, adolescent boys as well, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely younger men are more vulnerable. Um, the average age of entry into the sex trade, regardless of gender, is 12 or 13 years old. So what we're seeing in the Lehigh Valley has we have not had um, any young males, but that's because often young males are not as easily identified. Um, and also, it's just not as prevalent. There's not, there's, there's less vulnerability factors. Um, but I would also say that, you know, this, we get this question a lot, like, well, you know, this is not just, this is young men too. Yes, it is young men. However, in general, it's not about um, any, gender, it's not a woman's issue or um, a children's issue or an adult issue. The issue is sexual exploitation and the fact that we're using sex as a trade and anybody, a male or a female body, can be a commodity that can be used over and over and over again, which is why human trafficking is now second and almost ready to exceed drug trafficking okay. because the commodity itself can be used over and over. Okay. So what are the signs of human sex trafficking mm -hmm. so that people can recognize it and alert authorities to something like this? Yeah, so especially as you mentioned like with younger individuals, so runaway youth, um, bus stops, malls, these are all places that traffickers are, that's kind of their preying ground okay. because they're trying to identify vulnerable youth, vulnerable women, vulnerable people. Um, so some of the signs that are that are often missed, and there was just a great article from CNN that reported um, on a young girl that was missed in the ER. Um, so unexplained, when you think of uh, trafficking, you think of domestic violence. So unexplained bruises, unexplained um, trauma. So if you're in the medical field, like unexplained trauma to sexual organs and sexual areas of the body. Also, um, seeing someone act differently in the presence of another person, um, seeing like their attitude change or seeing them not being able to talk as freely it, are some of the signs, very, um, very shallow signs that uh, some people can begin to pay attention to in the community. Okay. Uh, what's next for VAST? Uh, where is the organization going and do you have any upcoming events that yeah. people that may be interested would want to go to? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have had five successful, we've had more than five successful prosecutions in the Lehigh Valley of traffickers. So we've kind of got this momentum under our belt and we want to keep moving and we really want to focus now on abolishing demand. Okay. And um, wh while continuing to care for victims and continuing this awesome prosecution team, um, response team that we have going on in the Lehigh Valley. And so uh, two events we have coming up in the future, September 17th, we have Arise. So this is a partner in the community, artists stand against sex trafficking. Okay. Um, that's September 17th at Lehigh University. And then in January, January 11th, we have our first annual gala to raise funds so that we can continue to grow as an organization and we can continue moving on in our strategy. Great, thank you, Christy, for yep. joining us. I thank really appreciate you, it. After the commercials, we take a visit to a local gun store, Relic Hunter Firearms, to talk politics and guns with the owner, Gerard. 
Hello everyone, welcome back. We're here at Relic Hunter Firearms with owner Gerard. Today we're going to talk to him about how political events and current events in the country affect firearm sales. Gerard, thanks for joining with me today. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Just want to go over, what are some of the reasons that people purchase firearms? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but the main ones are for uh, target practice, uh, for sporting and hunting, for concealed carry, and for uh, home protection. Someone walks into your shop, we have people here right now, mm -hmm. if they've never held a firearm before, what's the process that they go through? Well, the first thing we try to do is after we would de determine one of the uh, reasons that they want a firearm, whether it's for home protection, concealed carry, uh, hunting, target practice, then we try to find a firearm that fits them. And that a lot of times that depends on uh, the size of their hands, their arm strength, um, their overall size, and then what just feels comfortable to them. Is the Second Amendment still relevant? Absolutely. I believe in the uh, last eight years we've seen government overreach and uh, things like the IRS scandals that the government has done that let us know that uh, without the Second Amendment in our country, we're only one or two steps away from tyranny by the federal government. Okay. What kind of events or political events or current events mm -hmm. drive people into your shop to buy a firearm? What we've noticed in the last year or so is every time there's a call for gun control or there's a, an Islamic terror attack or a shooting or something like that, people are uh, very concerned and uh, they come in here, they're, they're worried, they uh, don't want to lose their Second Amendment rights. Okay. One of the biggest arguments in favor of gun control is that it's extremely easy to acquire a firearm. What's the process for buying a gun, and do you believe that there are any extra measures that can be taken without infringing on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens? Well, the, the, uh, the extra measures, I, I mean, that, that's kind of a complicated question, I would guess, but I think that uh, the measures that are in place right now are, are adequate. Uh, everyone that comes into a gun store has to go through a background check, and that is uh, overlooked in Pennsylvania by the PIC system, Pennsylvania Instant Check System, and nationally by the National Instant Check System, which PICS uh, defers to. So what would be an average wait time, do you feel, uh, with someone that goes through that process then? Uh, it takes uh, maybe uh, 15 to 20 minutes to uh, purchase a firearm. But it's an extensive search through computers. Absolutely. Systems. The instant check knows their entire record, background, everything, and if they are not eligible to buy one, they are denied. Okay, great. I think everyone agrees that safety is a key element to owning a firearm. Does your business offer safety training courses, and how readily available are those types of courses outside of your business walls? I think they're very uh, readily available. We have a woman who does uh, NRA certified training that anyone that offer, buys a pistol here, a new shooter, or, or even a non-new shooter, we can offer them for free a one hour course with her. And um, quite simply, they can go further as much as they want with her at a very, very reasonable price. Okay. It appears to me that the strictest gun bans in the United States like Chicago and Baltimore, are some of the most horrendous places for gun-related homicides for a couple years running now. We've taken firearms out of the hands of law-abiding citizens and left them at the mercy of criminals that in most cases have acquired their firearms illegally. If trained properly with safety and practice, how much better of a chance would a victim have of the, in these cities against a potential attack? I, I don't even think you can quantify that. It's such a high rate that they would be more protected. Um, any uh, mass shooting for people and above uh, is 92% in a gun-free zone. So 8% where people have guns, and if people are in that area and trained with a firearm, uh, the casualty count would be much less. Gerard, in your honest opinion, where do you think we are heading as a nation in regards to our mentality and policies on guns? I think uh, we're very polarized in the country right now by it. The, uh, fortunately, we have the Second Amendment that uh, stands in the way of an encroaching federal government to use certain events to want to restrict or to take away your firearms privileges. Okay. And if people are more interested in getting information on coming to your shop here, uh, where would they go to find that information? 
Find us on Facebook at Relic Hunter Firearms. All right, Gerard, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. And now for my conservative reflection. Breakups are never easy, and so it is with this one as well. I never wanted it to come to this, and as a matter of fact, things were supposed to get easier, but I've lost faith in our goals, which used to be aligned. We spent 13 years together, and after college, I moved back to the area to be with you because we had a great thing going. But you, public education, have proven time and time again that we just aren't on the same page anymore. Where do I start? Well, for one, schools used to be controlled almost entirely by the local people. Throughout the last century, that relationship has devolved into more and more federal control, to the point now that educational matters are mandated instead of voted on. Let's agree that the number one priority of our educational system is the children. Well, statistics here in the United States are showing a decline in the proficiency of reading, writing, mathematics, and science. We as a country spend double what other countries do per pupil and consistently rank lower. Our relationship is ranked at 27th in the world. 27th. A curriculum based largely on the ideas of bureaucrats called Common Core is treating our children like guinea pigs. When it comes to math, Common Core values the process rather than the solution. Students are given credit for right and wrong answers if they use Common Core. What happened to us? We had a good thing going. I'd give you the right answer and you'd stand by my side. We were always taught that children learn by seeing, hearing, reasoning, and actively participating, but Common Core replaces that mentality by demanding it be the only way. Parents are so lost, there are actually classes for them to learn Common Core. I don't have a problem trying to work with you, but we can't make our relationship better if you refuse to speak my language. If kids aren't wrapped up enough being confused about Common Core, surely they are just studying for the next state standardized test that has become routine method for schools to prove where they stand in comparison with other schools. Why are you testing our love? This takes us to teachers, fantastic individuals that dedicated their lives to the betterment of their communities. Yet with standardized tests around every corner, they end up spending more time teaching to a useless test and less time dedicated to the studies they need to teach. Teachers are quitting the profession all over the country. Why? Because you want them to be more machine than human, regurgitating information like a Google search result. I thought you loved us for our ability to analyze and create, not repeat and imitate. These situations would be alleviated if it weren't for the districts being held hostage and blackmailed by the state and federal government under threats of losing funding if we don't use this mandated garbage. Why are you selling out our love? Maybe the schools are left with little choice, but then the system also leaves parents with little choice. We should be able to pick the school that best fits the needs of our children. Schools that don't try to undermine the morals and values we instill into our children at every possible turn. Yet, to send our kids to these schools, we have to pay tuition on top of taxes we pay for the local public school our children aren't even attending. This means we end up paying for two educations when our kids are only receiving one. Meanwhile, public education system doesn't understand that they need to do a better job of competing to teach our children. Let's not forget that the system hurts the community as well. Property taxes are raised on everyone, including those without children in the schools and those living on retirement fixed incomes, every time a school budget is increased. Let's fix this by eliminating property taxes and instead raising the sales tax by 2% allocating that as educational vouchers for each of the state's students and allowing families to pick the school that best fits their child's needs. Let's talk about zero tolerance policies. News stories across the country have shown kids being suspended or expelled for eating a Pop-Tart into the shape of an L, a pointing of a finger, and a three-inch G.I. Joe gun as second-degree firearm offenses. We used to have schools that taught firearm safety classes, and now, in a post-Columbine world, we are afraid to have armed security guards on school campuses, opting to instead put up gun-free zone signs in hopes it deters criminal behavior. So in the end, I send my kid off to school to complete a lot of stressful testing, learn complicated methodologies under frustrated teachers that desperately want to teach freely and creatively in a potentially unsafe environment protected by mere signs then I end up paying for these things that I disagree with out of fear that there might be a walkout which would require me to stay home from my job to babysit. 
a job that not only pays for my family, but is also allocated through taxes to the district to pay for all of this. When people break up, the line is usually, it's not you, it's me. But if we're being really honest here, it is you. You are failing the people of this country. The more you take control from the local districts and place it into the hands of unelected bureaucrats, the worse it's going to get. I'm the Generation Y conservative. Have a great night and God bless America.